established this in, converged upon the United States for training and indoctrination. The new curriculum was either the one at Fort Bragg or like it. The Army interest in political, social, economic programs under the general concept of nation building was gaining momentum. For every class of foreigners who were trained and indoctrinated with these ideas, there were American instructors and American soldiers who were being brainwashed by the very fact that they were being trained to teach this new doctrine. To them, this non-military, political, social, and economic theme was the true doctrine of the U.S. Army. A whole generation of the American Army has grown up with this and now believes to one degree or another that the natural role of an army lies in this political field. They believe the army is the chosen instrument in nation building, whether the subject be political, social, economic, or military. In many cases, due to the great emphasis the CIA placed on training the police forces of certain foreign countries, a large number of American servicemen who were used for such training became active in what was really police work and not the scope of regular military work. Uh, that's just, to me, it is, it is so fundamental, this idea of what we saw so much in the 60s and 70s, where we sensed as a nation, some of us at least, that these police re agencies in other countries that were being so repressive were somehow operating under our tutelage. And well, in fact... <coughs> the best model is Iran. <coughs> you see, <coughs> under this philosophy, we moved into Iran after 1949 <coughs> in, uh, in large numbers, the agency was involved all over in Iran, everywhere. Where the agency founded the Iranian airline, and and many other things like that. The the military had all kinds of radar detection devices up there for scanning into the Soviet Union, but also this provided the backbone of a lot of activity in Iran. But it led to <coughs> programs where we actually imported thousands of Iranian young men, selected to be leaders in Iran then and for future years. And they went to uh, technical schools in the United States. They went to Fort Bragg. They went to all kinds of schools. And, and they were actually given very, very useful training from their point of view and then were put back into Iran. And by the later years of this program, you know, into the mid-70s and so on, the CIA had uh, enormous dossiers of people in Iran. They knew every person who would be of use in any area, electronics or academically or medical and so on, because we had brought them over here for some kind of training. Iran was probably the test bed for this to its extreme. And of course the Shah was uh, right in the middle of it. You know, as I wrote in a book, I think one of the, or I wrote in, a, in another article, one of the most uh, important assignments made by Nixon when he was president was Richard Helms, the, the former director of Central Intelligence, as ambassador to Iran. We, we completely uh, you might say, converted Iran into this type of dream, which is an offshoot of the little red book of Mao Zedong. Mm. And uh, as a result, we got what we planted. You know, we, we sowed the seeds and we got it. Now, the people in Iran who are in power have access to the same people that we've trained here. They know more about us than we do about them. This is something people don't realize about the uh, more or less problems we're having today. They wonder how the Iranians can do this and how the Iranians can do that. Well, behind the screen of this man Khomeini, all these thousands of Iranians that we've trained are totally familiar with our system, just like Noriaga and Panama. Just because there was a coup d'etat doesn't mean these people forget the things we trained them to do. And now we're paying the price by having well-trained individuals in many of these countries that uh, in a sense have turned that training against us or at least have said look we understand you better than you think we do now lay off us see and like Noriaga saying so and and even to a degree what's happening in Nicaragua is an outgrowth of this mm -hmm. because if you teach the people that the army is the chosen instrument to control the country and, and then they do that and the army does take over they think that's what we were telling them to do you see it's it's a very interesting thing and uh, we need to think about it very much because it has shaped what we've been doing in many countries. The thing is, if you look very carefully at what the men that started this movement were writing and doing, and I mean by that the White House report written by Stilwell and Lansdale, then you'll begin to get a perspective of what has happened since those years and why it happened. 
Uh, I think most of us would not really expect the army to be the leavening inst instrument in any political scramble, like in, in Chile, for example. Uh, Allende is elected by the people, and then he's killed by Pinochet. Which one would we, should we really, as Americans, be supporting? Well, Pinochet is the man we trained. Allende, we, we say, oh my goodness, he's a, he's a communist, he's a socialist, so on. So we reap what we sowed when we get that sort of thing. And I think that's really what I'm trying to say in the book, that this is the way things were going in that era. I think this also <clears throat> shows you that when the Kennedy administration began to realize some of the things that uh, were going on, how they had been going on, they began to make major changes. They began to stop some of these things. And I think that it's that kind of pressure, that universal pressure, not any given point, but that universal pressure against the system that was heavily implanted that led to Kennedy's death. That it, it would seem so. Um, I'm just trying to catch a few last things in the remaining 20 minutes we have. One is, in terms of Kennedy, you write, Kennedy knew that he had been badly burned by the Bay of Pigs incident, and by June of 1961, with these NSAMs 55 through 57, he and Bobby knew that he had been let down by the ST, or secret team, and in parentheses you say, I carefully switched to the ST label here, because in all fairness to the CIA, it was more than the CIA that really created the unfortunate operation. I was wondering if you could give some sort of summation of how the ST is, in your sense or eyes, larger than the CIA, and what other groups, if such can be named, it, compromise, it comprises. Well, if you analyze the Bay of Pigs operation very carefully, you'll see that its components uh, were far beyond any capability of the agency unless they had the very willing and active support of the, of the rest of the government. And the rest of the government in a secret team mode. You see, not a regularly established air arm of the Air Force, not a regular established sea arm of the Navy with the Navy logistics. In it. For instance, at the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Navy logistics behind all that was enormous. People didn't realize it, but it took place. Well, the same thing with the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. And the Navy was there. They weren't called upon. They shouldn't have been called upon, but they were there. Even the State Department involved in the political side of this thing. Who would follow Castro? Who would be the chosen people to follow Castro? And there were large financial expenditures and such a thing. These things don't take place within the CIA alone. And it's important to see the CIA that way. The CIA is always merged with the rest of the government that's taking part in these actions. Yeah. Well, because this was true over such a long period of time, there were people who were very familiar, well trained with this kind of thing, and every time a covert activity came up, they were involved again. Well, this is the secret team. They can carry these out, and now with the Iran-Contra exposure, you can see that the secret team even bred the enterprise, people who were making money off this deal. It went beyond even getting the job done. They were doing it so good they had money to spare, see? And that's exactly what I was talking about. It's almost as though we ran the Bay of Pigs operation as a commercial venture, uh, hoping that when they took over Cuba, uh, some of the leaders would gain the casino rights and everything else back into Cuba. As a matter of fact, I, I think I said something there that's ahead of myself. A broker called me from Washington a few days before the Bay of Pigs was planned to go and said, Colonel Prouty, he just happened to know me. He didn't know my job. And he said, Colonel, can you give me any explanation why all of a sudden people from the Pentagon are calling me buying sugar stock? Sugar stock had dropped to pennies because Castro had boycotted the, the American sugar down there and the companies had lost a lot of money. But all of a sudden, people who knew about the, pro the prospect of the invade were buying sugar stock, $10,000, $20,000 at a time, and the sugar stock demand was going up before the Bay of Pigs. Well, so they were running it as a commercial venture. You know, there were some more enterprises then. And it's inevitable. You know, you're dealing with these things, you, you do that. So you can't say that the Bay of Pigs was 100% a CIA operation. Yeah. The government becomes involved in these things. Okay. Any more than you could say the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, from 45 to 65, was very much under the operational control of CIA. From 65 on, the CIA was still there more than ever, but the military moved in and the military took over. It became too big for the CIA. Mm -hmm.
Um, this, I, if you can, try to discuss to me this uh, crippling and devastating contradiction that covert operations have to be deniable because the commander-in-chief must otherwise, if they are undeniable, accept responsibility for involvement, quote, in an illegal and traditionally unpardonable activity. We were operating from 1954 under an NSC directive that required that any and every covert operation leave room for the government, U.S. government, to disclaim plausibly its role, that it was not involved. Take the U-2 that went down in the Soviet Union. If you'd had a chance to study that plane, you'd find that every single instrument in the plane, the cloth and the fabric of the pilot's clothing, the tires, everything, had no names whatsoever. It didn't say Goodyear tires or something like that. You know, uh, everything in it, those were scrubbed clean in order to retain deniability. We could say we had nothing to do with it. Well, of course, the, Bay the uh, U-2 going down it was a uh, very faulty operation, but I cite that. Aircraft that I operated, for instance, in aerial overflights to supply the rebels fighting for the lives of their country in Tibet, every marker on those airplanes have been changed, Every are cleaned off, scrubbed off, sanitized. We call them sanitized air. It cost us millions of dollars to sanitize these aircraft because we had to deny, if the plane went down, we had to deny we had anything to do with it. Uh, th this is, in a sense, ridiculous, because you can't do it. Oh, the type of planes we use were made in the United States, and so on. No one else uh, but, could build a plane Well, like that. but a lot of people used them. See, we okay. used 130 aircraft, they were used all over the world. It, it, it was effective in those things, but if you did get caught, they could quickly analyze who would be doing this, and it comes down to the United States or <laughs> one or two others at the most. But that aspect of the deniability was required by NSC directive, and we spent millions of dollars trying to carry it out. However, once the operation gets above the bonfire fire stage, you can't hide it. You see, we used to know that when they tell us we're going to Indonesia with a covert operation, and right away they asked me for 42,000 rifles. I mean, that's not a covert. You see, you can't, you can't deny that 42,000 American-made rifles show up in Indonesia and we had nothing to do with it. So there's a bit of a hypocrisy in that prospect. But in the early Eisenhower era, when that was written, they never intended operations to become large enough to be out of hand. Even the Bay of Pigs, as I have stressed earlier, was intended to be small aerial drops over the beach things, never an invasion. The invasion idea started after the Kennedy election in November of, uh, of 60. Mm -hmm. So I find nothing wrong with these statements about the fact that the government attempted to keep these things really covert. But, uh, in fact, we haven't addressed NSA on 57, but 57 yeah. speaks of uh, covert activities up to a certain point may be assigned to CIA, up to a certain size, may be assigned, and after that size, they may be assigned to the military. Well, they began to recognize in that era that there's only certain small things that should be assigned to CIA. After that, it's a military point. You might just as well hoist the flag and say, Americans are coming. You, you can't deny it. You can't hide it. And if you have to put up with this kind of action, which is a denial of the national sovereignty of your target country, no matter who it is, whether it's Iran or whether it's Peru or whether it's Indonesia, what you're really doing is denying the sovereignty of another nation. And that's criminal among the family of nations. So there's important considerations here, but in covert activities, you live with that. But given that it's such a paradox, paradoxical uh, statement of our times, given that they are illegal, that they do violate whatever nation's sovereignty that we uh, move within without their approval, and then that there have been these incidents where the true nature of it, to some degree at least, has become known, and they become compromised, and you can't deny them. The most blatant one recently is when Neil's uh, the uh, whatever his first name was got north to admit that basically everyone except the American people knew what North knew about these things and the only persons that North was concealing it was from was from the American public no one else and and the 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 poverty of that type of admission 
and how damaging it was, but there's never any analysis of the real impact or implications for what that means. The way we withdrew from the world court would be an example mm -hmm. of just, well, we'll solve the problem by just withdrawing from a court that rules against us. It says that we committed an illegal act when we covertly bombed the uh, harbors of Nicaragua. Uh, how much longer do you feel we can go on uh, with this kind of illegality? Well, <clears throat> let's be blunt about it. I have read in other books, and uh, I only say that to soften the blow, <laughs> and I believe thoroughly that there is no longer anything called sovereignty. It doesn't exist. Yeah. We are kidding ourselves if we think uh, sovereignty exists any longer. If we want to just consider the fact that Soviet satellites circle over our country every half hour, obtain almost any information they want. If you go into the world of finance, and the world of communications, and the world of transportation, the whole global aspect, Walter Riston himself, Mr. U.S. Banker, has written a book called Risk and Other Four-Letter Words, in which he says categorically that we live in a one-world financial communications uh, sphere, and that there is no such thing as national sovereignty. I think we need to think about that and believe it, and we reside in that community now, it's the way things are. Uh, the idea that there's such things as covert operations is kind of an old-time uh, deal. It's like going back to horse and buggy. Uh, I think people that want to dwell on the fact that sovereignty ought to exist because it's a blessed event, well, that's gone, and I, I feel sorry for them. I've had a lot of people argue bitterly with me over that point, but how are you going to deny it? How's yeah. Walter Biston going to deny it? Yeah. So what we're really doing is we are, I read only recently something that I have written about and believe that we no longer are going to be able to resort to warfare. Now, nations are built on warfare. Nations retain their ability to control their people on the basis of the fact that they have an enemy somewhere and they must prepare for war. Now, that's traditional. That goes way back, but that's ended. And in place of that, covert operations is one side of it, but not a very good one. The other side is the enormous power of the economy today. And here, the United States, at least up to now, has had the advantage in economic power, just like we used to have the advantage in nuclear power. Uh, I think that this will be where the major struggles are fought, and I think that's why there's a realignment now coming about, because it serves no purpose for nations to sit each on one side of the world and the other with hydrogen bombs and thumb their nose at each other. We both know that, given uh, barring a mistake, an uh, absolute stupid mistake, there's no point in launching hydrogen bombs. Yeah. So a lot of the things that the government wrote in the 50s and the, took place in the Kennedy era in the 60s or that I wrote in the 70s and so on are really caught up by time. We live in the 80s and we're getting into the 90s and the warfare from here on out is going to be economic. And it bothers me considerably to find that for the last decade we have had a president who reduced our economic position to an all terrible de deficit and handed over to his successor a checkbook with an overdrawn account. This means the United States is not going to be able to write any checks or to carry out initiatives because we're broke. And in the days when you're going to run an economic war, the worst thing that could happen is to be broke. Mm -hmm. And these are the things we need to think about today. And I just as soon give up the whole idea of the secret team because I don't think we're going to be calling on that kind of an operation any longer. I think the shambles of the Iran thing and the Contra thing is, is the end of it. I think it's wrapped up that kind of work. It doesn't accomplish anything. And the secrecy surrounding it does just what you said. We kept the secret from the American people. The rest of the world were laughing at us. But this is, will be overwhelmed by our present situation in the economic world where we are broke. And if we don't do something about that, uh, we're going to have many more serious problems than we've had looking down the guns at nuclear weapons and so on. I guess it's just a last question then as far as this, the looking at the momentum or the uh, inertia of something like the secret team as far as the support of the defense industry, that which Eisenhower warned, which he had learned about so painfully when his crusade for peace had been shattered by powers going down right before he went to see Khrushchev. Uh, just as a, I guess, challenging you here to uh, 
give a sense of how this might come about. It seems like the inertia is still there so much. How do you get people who have for years profited and gained so much by the kind of uh, uh, defense, military, Iron Triangle uh, system to get them to break that? You wrote, uh, with regard to the creation of the U-2 plane by Lockheed, largely through the doggedness of Vice President Kelly Johnson, successfully selling the idea for this product to the Air Force, uh, what about th the fact that this was a classic example of how a project that should have been military because it was too large to be clandestine became covert simply as an expedient and that the reasoning was that in peacetime it could not be military because it was clandestine so it was to be directed by the CIA the typical secret team tautology I think that's a good way to put it but I think that's one of the things that I am saying is behind us. I see. Uh, because, uh, for instance, look at the problems the government is having attempting to introduce the B-1 and B-2 bombers mm -hmm. into some reasonable strategy. There's no role for them. There's yeah. nothing to do with them. Yeah. And the fact that they're so-called stealthy, or at least the B-2 is supposed to be stealthy, that only means stealthy in an environment of radar. It makes more noise than, than, than old bombers used to. We used to hear our old bombers before the radar was developed. You see, a lot of these things are developed to sell the product. Right. So the idea of going back to that world is, is behind us. And I don't, I don't think it's going to stop. Yeah. What we're going to do is move into the energy and food eras and we will spend as much time dominating the production of energy and the selling of energy products and food production as we used to spend on B-2 bombers and the things like that. The government doesn't stand still and it's, we're not going to be defeated by anybody but the weapons are going to be different. Yeah. There's more talk today about Malthusianism. There's more talk today about biological warfare and I think there's more talk today about mind control. Uh, these are weapons again, but it's a different kind of war. So we can say that all of these things that were written in the 50s and the 60s certainly existed, but I don't see them replicated in the 90s and after the year 2000. But I think the big war will be over the energy supplies and over food supplies. And uh, of course, energy supplies, that war started in 1973. The Arab oil embargo w was given the same treatment that uh, covert wa operations were. The only people that didn't know what was really going on in the Persian Gulf were the American people. We were just paying for it at the gas tank, but we didn't know why. Yeah. Well, th these are very critical things, but that's going to be the future of this business. Yeah. Well, that's a good close-off on the secret team. Thank you. <laughs>